Okay, so welcome everybody. We are very happy to be here in the first, first full paper session of uh, Participatory Design Conference 2020 um, in Newcastle and in 60 other, 16 other PD places around the world. Um, my name is Andrea Botero uh, and I am the session chair for this. Um, we are I'm going on the first one. It's still no nice yeah. sound. We are going to uh, have uh, four wonderful uh, papers uh, under the theme of unsettling and decolonizing onto epistems, which is at the core of this year's uh, conference theme. So I welcome you. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, Paulina, can I have the, the next slide? So I'm joining you at, oh, sorry, the previous one. <laughs> I'm joining you from what is known today uh, as Helsinki, uh, once a Tavastian fisherman settlement in the Baltic uh, that is home today uh, for an increasingly diverse population, including privileged academic immigrants like myself. I would like to acknowledge the hard work, the happiness and the struggles of all of us that try to make livable homes for us, for our dear ones and for others here and from wherever you are joining us today. Uh, if you would like to acknowledge uh, the places and the lands where you are joining us today, I invite you to do so in the chat. Uh, welcome and thank you for being here with us. Can I have the next slide, Paulina, please? Um, sorry, uh, so uh, uh, first a short reminder of our guidelines for being together. Uh, in the conference. Uh, 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 it's, it's a product of a collective process uh, that we have started a few years ago to think about how we want to be together uh, in these spaces. And we have here a very short version of it. Um, and I would like you to be mindful of, of the difference and be patient with our technical constraints. Um, uh, welcome you to listen deeply and participate with respect. Uh, be careful of your choice of words uh, and try to be inclusive in your language. Uh, let's not pre trivialize or um, uh, criticize um, without being respectful, uh, whatever it is that we are all talking here today. Um, we are recording this uh, session. Please, if you wish to be anonymous, uh, we ask you to turn off your camera and they identify yourself uh, uh, with your name in the Zoom. Um, thank you for joining us. And we are going to uh, start uh, with the first, um, the first uh, paper. We have the video uh, recorded ready. And uh, uh, Male is having trouble um, joining um, the, the session. So we will leave the uh, uh, questions, clarifying questions uh, uh, for her turn to the end. So she has time to, to, to enter the, the space and, and don't need to rush, but we will probably be, Amale, ah, can you hear? It's the sound already. Great. So maybe we can start now with the, uh, with the video since uh, I think Male was able to join us. Thank you very much. Hello, um, I am Male Lujanes Calante. I'm a senior lecturer in, in co-design and I work in the service design masters in London College of Communication. And I'm presenting this paper with Chris Mortimer. Uh, she's a senior international teaching fellow at Lancaster Management School at Lancaster University. And our paper is titled Value Mapping Transitions into the Pluriverse. And basically we're sharing our design notes and our reflections on methods uh, incorporating traditional ecological knowledge into emergency community resilient plants in three countries of the rings on fire, Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines. Um, 
We begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands across three continents where we were converging virtually today, paying our respects to their elders past and present. Male, me, I'm from Venezuela, uh, from the Andes, uh, is the land of the Motocuicas, but uh, living and presenting from Bristol, the UK, at the historical center of piracy and slavery that impact the past and present of many lands and specifically the Caribbean where I grew up. And I'm Chris and I'm English, um, white British, and I'm presenting from York, uh, the historical merchant center, particularly famous for its chocolate production using cacao and sugar ex exploited from many lands, particularly from the Caribbean, and this creates an ancestral link between us. Our work has entangled us with um, China and Southeast Asia, and this entanglements and the ethical implications are actually the focus of our presentation. In February 2019, we embarked on a research networking trip that took us from Bandung, Java to China, mostly over land. However, it became a transgressive onto epistemological search that started our own transition into worlds where many worlds fit, a journey into the pluriverse. Most importantly, it sparked a radical questioning of our own practices, making us realize three years later that we're actually only at the beginning. Through our paper, we discuss the context of this journey and its aftermath through our understanding of tech, the impact of value mapping and the ethical entanglements that we encounter. The following intertwined threads underpin these elements, giving a context to this journey into the pluriversal design. Global Challenges Research Funding is the UK government's response to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which encourage cross-disciplinary academic research to tackle global challenges in countries identified as least developed and lower income countries by the Development Assistance Committee, who describe themselves as the venue and voice of the world's major donors. We found that the very language of both these institutions precedes and defines roles as vertical rather than horizontal participation, even before the research encounters. We find ourselves at the very heart of this situation, attending events that incentivize world leading researchers to carry out this work. Trending literature criticizes the agenda in terms of negative impact of British led projects, which power Western academic research profiles but leave behind very little that fulfills the need to engage communities, the inclusion of local stakeholders and ensuring community self I'm sorry, it seems we have lost uh, Paulina, who's actually sharing the, the video, and Rachel is now our host. <laughs> our technical, technical glitches with, um, uh, with the Zoom. Um, are we able to? Yeah, I will um, try and reshare the video. Yeah. One minute, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll share my screen now. Great. Uh, 
Most importantly, it sparked a radical question making us realize three years later that we're actually only at the beginning. Through our paper, we discuss the context of this journey and its aftermath through our understanding of tech, the impact of value mapping and the ethical entanglements that we encounter. The following intertwined threads underpin these elements, giving a context to this journey into the pluriversal design. Global Challenges Research Funding is the UK government's response to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which encourage cross-disciplinary academic research to tackle global challenges in countries identified as least developed and lower income countries by the Development Assistance Committee, who describe themselves as the venue and voice of the world's major donors. We found that the very language of both these institutions precedes and defines roles as vertical rather than horizontal participation, even before the research encounters. We find ourselves at the very heart of this situation, attending events that incentivize world leading researchers to carry out this work. Trending literature criticizes the agenda in terms of negative impact of British led projects, which power Western academic research profiles but leave behind very little that fulfills the need to engage communities, the inclusion of local stakeholders and ensuring community self-determination and participatory governance. Our second thread of the context is our work in resilience theory, particularly in the context of emergency response and risk management. Resilience theory um, talks about or is based on this balance or is convergence of the organizations that manage resources and the organizations that manage knowledge. This balance will determine the adaptive capacity to the disturbance of the communities, being this the uh, emergencies. Uh, and examples of organizations that manage resources are, for example, the UN Disaster Risk Reduction or the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, international organizations, but also national governmental organizations like public health. Organizations that manage knowledge are, for example, uh, spaces where techno and scientific knowledge grow, for example, universities, uh, or religion or cultural traditions like museums. Um, and this creates cultural trust that is necessary for organizations to respond to emergency and communities to create cultural trust in these organizations. From an Anglo-centric position, we are looking at the world through John Law's ideas of the one world world, assuming that the rest of humanity understand and trust our organizations that manage knowledge and resources. The pandemic highlights this distinction where the pandemic discourse in the UK drew on World War II narratives to underpin trust, calmness and hope in our institutions. However, these discourses are not globally applicable or acceptable, creating an onto-epistemological disconnect between Anglo-based researchers and the worlds in which we are encouraged through funding to participate in. All of this comes into sharp focus when attending two GCRF events in Malaysia, where we met academic and non-academic researchers and stakeholders from across disciplines, sectors and agencies working in disaster risk management. The reoccurring theme was how to bring together the necessary technological capability to anticipate, predict and model disasters, whilst understanding communication and mobilising local communities. Some of these issues include the myriad of languages spoken in Indonesia, over 800 languages, the multiplicity of religions and traditional cultures. In Malaysia alone, there are six main religious or belief systems and a variety of Malay indigenous belief clusters. Challenging access and transport infrastructure. The Philippines, for example, has 7,640 islands. Conflicting local and national building policies with local houses versus tourist development. There's also uneven levels of poverty, accentuating social inequalities and discrimination, particularly in gender and religion, and access to education. The outcome of these conversations was pointing to the need of DRM strategies and solutions that could work hand in hand with community-led initiatives.
So we saw that the convergence necessary in between the organizations that manage knowledge and the organizations that manage resources, not in all the all our contexts happens. Instead, there is a divergence. And so we um, identified our role as researchers with work in these transitions, how we go from this convergence to a that from this divergence to a com convergence to increase community resilience. And we found home a theoretical framework of pluriversal design that is, was inspired in theories of the Wemby Beer by Alberto Costas of the two books of Arturo Escobar's on the pluriverse and the pluriverse design, and particularly John Slow work and the One World War that help us to articulate um, some binary differentiations that we were trying to escape from, for example, the West and the East, or the capitalist and the or developed and underdeveloped. And in methodological sense, we found inspirations in the tools um, proposed by transition design. In our paper through the literature review, we highlight the beneficial impacts of a horizontal relationship between tech and one world world science. Tech is defined around four main characteristics, which include a focus on place, other ways of knowing, is participatory and communal, and is dynamic. Tech does not refer to static knowledge, nor the merely primitive attempts to account for natural phenomena. It is a process of constant revision and dynamic application of practical technical knowledge. The smoke story was an inspiration for us and highlighted the connection between modern times and events and stories and nursery rhymes from the past. Unraveling these threads, it becomes clear that efforts from management and knowledge institutions must be directed to learn from traditional based existing institutions, systems of beliefs and technical ecological knowledge, not to gain more control agency and develop cultural trust, but to transform and adapt informed by tech systems that have a millennial understanding of the social ecological balance between disturbance and adaptive cap cap capability. So we got really inspired when we learned about this story of a lullaby saving uh, hundreds of people in Ireland. And we uh, start thinking in how can we uh, design for transitions within the um, domain of emergency response and risk management. Um, and our, our thought was to integrate um, participants' own traditional knowledges, given that in our workshops were um, a big diversity. So we run three workshops, one in Malaysia, one in Indonesia, and then the other in the Philippines, and with participants that were um, researchers from different disciplines, from tourism to geography, and emergency, or coming from work in emergency response agencies. And we, we did something that we call the value mapping, and it has uh, a lot of reference. I invite you to, to, to read our paper because it also describes exactly how we deploy it. But basically, we um, ask our participants to integrate the traditional ecological knowledge into the mapping of the emergency situation. Mapping of an emergency situation is something that they regularly do in their work when they are planning or when they are reflecting on an emergency response. However, we, with the integration of traditional ecological knowledge, we've uh, had three insights. The most impo impactful was the change of representations. Um, these uh, emergency mappings usually happen in a timeline. So what happened in the first second, in the three minutes, in the first day, and so on. However, by introducing traditional ecological knowledge, um, the representations were in a space, and it was embedded in either land or objects. The other principles that helped us to design this uh, method was a principle of controversy. That in this one we differ from some issues of co-design or design thinking, and we were um, careful to bring the controversies rather than to uh, align to a consensus. And the third principle was the principle of sentipensar, of feeling thinking, and it's about um, being aware of the different values in the systems where we were working. We think through our conclusions, considering not only our positionality, but also our temporality, the changing moments in which the project takes place. 
We undertook this research whilst living and teaching in one of the places that has been called a new city or ghost town of China and is composed of new high rise apartments in which live relocated fishing and agricultural communities. The modernization dream of China meets the traditional. Encounters at Nanhai catalyzed a constant interrogation of Chinese and one world world systems not just at the theoretical level, but at a level that troubles the personal and what it means to know, to teach, to research, to design and to manage. We find ourselves in a critical mode of transition of becoming with a not yetness. There is an evolving literature concerned with the ethical problems of researching tech. These include pick and mix of those knowledges verified by One World World Science, unbalanced power relationships between researchers and communities, resulting often in er erroneous interpretations of tech holistic systems and organisations. We experienced how our perceived epistemic authority, the one gained from associations with a British university, did open spaces to be listened and heard to set up collaborations. All opportunities we questioned whether our colleagues from the Ring of Fire would have if it were in their agendas and interests to develop work in the UK. This weight of perceived authority was something we do not want to carry. It is, is it even possible to reject one's own privileges? Do we have any rights to do this work? How can we deal with this? In understanding research and innovation as crucial instruments of sustaining one world world's global systems of control via ideas of development, Tyfield suggests that to think beyond neoliberalism, we must first think with it and recognize each and every contribution of knowledge as technologies of power. In this sense, by acknowledging our positionality and temporality, we, could, we need to constantly think, what is our offer in this transaction? What skills, what knowledge, what technology of power can we use to scaffold civic participation? And can participatory design inserted within transition design and designed for the pluriverse framework aid to transit the often murky relationship between us and them? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Malian and, um, and Christine uh, for your wonderful presentation. We have, uh, without technical glitches, probably one uh, chance uh, for a clarifying question uh, from, from the audience, uh, if, if there is one. Uh, uh, at, at least so far, nothing has, has come. Um, uh, but maybe I then will suggest that we continue with them. Uh, with the next one, because I think uh, the all the papers resonate so well to each other with with each other that I think we will have a wonderful opportunity to to discuss together um, more this issue once we once we see the other papers. If if you um, uh, Mali, I would just like to check if your video and sound are working. Can you can you turn off your video and sound? And I can uh, turn on my. Uh, microphone but not my video but good, good morning everyone <laughs> great but 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 we can hear you that's fine what about christine yes i'm here great and i have my video there we go yeah fantastic. all working <laughs> fantastic paper thank you very much so I think now uh, continue to our third uh, paper because I think that once we have them all, uh, we'll have really uh, very uh, fruitful ground for, for more discussion. So welcome now to uh, Rachel Clark, which will be sharing her paper, Indigenous, sorry, uh, decolonizing in by and through participatory design with political activists in Palestine. Thank you. Hello, thanks for coming to our presentation, Decolonizing in, by and through participatory design with political activists in Palestine. I'm Rachel, I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues and co-authors, Reem, Ahmed, Kifa, Owen, Mark and Matt. But first, an acknowledgement of country. نعترف ونشكر القائمين بالماضي والحاضر على الأراضي الحدودية في شمال شرق إنجلترا وأراضي فلسطين بصفتنا أكاديميين نستمتع بامتيازات مختلفة في المملكة المتحدة ولبنان وفلسطين 
فإننا نعترف بقصص هجرة أسلافنا وتشابكات بناء وطن وعنف الحكم البريطاني وما نتج عنه من أضرار استعمارية مستمرة نحن ندرك كيف أدى ذلك إلى خلق امتيازات غير متكافئة والاضطهاد المرتبط بالصراع القائم على الأراضي We give thanks to the stewards of the land, both past and present, in the borderlands of Northeast England and Palestine. As differently privileged academics from the UK, Lebanon and Palestine, we acknowledge our ancestors' migrant her stories, the entanglements of nation building, violence of British rule and resulting ongoing colonial harms. We recognize how this has created uneven privileges and oppressions associated with land-based conflicts that this paper speaks to. So as an overview, um, in the paper and in, in our presentation, our aim is to unpack and unsettle experiences of decolonizing PD praxis. And this is responding to recent calls for acknowledging our ways of being and knowing and interrogating and reporting on these in design. We ask, what does decolonizing PD praxis mean when entangled with the geopolitics of international development land-based conflict and settler colonial violence. And we ask this question in the context of indigenous youth responses to and experiences of house demolition in Palestine. So the rest of the paper, we uh, describe our positionality, geopolitics and corporate politics, the context of working with indigenous Palestinian youth and Bedouin activists, the project aims and timeline and we finish with a tentative conceptual framework to support different orientations of decolonizing for PD praxis. So decolonizing in, by, and through participatory design. So it's also important to not acknowledge how we are differently constituted through a patchwork of positionalities as Palestinian, Lebanese, and British researchers. We therefore experience varying privileges and oppressions that affect how to speak ethically with to and about Palestinians vulnerable to the threat of house demolition. And experiencing these different geographies through our positionalities creates an unsettling recognition of privilege and uncertainty. And this is pulled in and out of focus in embodied and visceral ways. The physical movement between places and our orientation speak to issues of inequitable corporate politics underpinning this work. And a concrete example of this is when we're physically going to different parts of Palestine passing through checkpoints that some of us are able or unable to go through without significant fear of questioning. So this is the land that is contested and the site for our project in Southern Palestine. Maybe you can see some of the structures that sit within the landscape that make use of the formation of the hills, the herding caves, the long-standing watercourses and the combination of local and found materials. These and other structures are at threat of demolition and where the youth activists live and work. In contrast, you might notice the houses that sit on top of the hill. These are part of an illegal Israeli settlement. This is fenced off from the indigenous village. These are not at threat of demolition. So some wider context for the landscape. Israel and Palestine was partitioned by the British after the Second World War in 1948. Many Palestinians were displaced, moving to neighboring Lebanon, Jordan, or zoned into the West Bank and Gaza. On the left is a military map from 1949 showing the newly formed borders. And the, the West Bank is next to Jordan, and Gaza is by the coast next to Egypt. So in 1993, the West Bank was further divided into three distinct zones, A, B, and C. And you can see here in the middle image, activists that we worked with live in area C. And this is the largest area. The infrastructure here is governed by the Israeli civil administration. ICAR are responsible for issuing planning permissions. And despite a significant need for new homes in the area C, the majority of permissions granted are limited. They disproportionately favor Israeli settlements. 
People who do build without permission face demolition orders, such as this one on the right. These are highly complex multilingual documents in Arabic and Hebrew. They combine British, Israeli, Jordanian and Ottoman laws. They can be legally contested, but are often difficult to understand, even by professional lawyers who have a good understanding of the language and a good understanding of the context. Court cases are rarely favourable to Palestinian families and they are very costly. And a house can have a demolition order on it for many years, but residents are not always clear when the order will be acted on. So in this context, for many people living in Area C in the West Bank, the experience of house demolitions and the anticipatory violence and loss of home are closely connected to mass displacement experienced during the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948. During this time, around 650,000 Palestinians were forcibly displaced from their homes and became refugees when the Israeli state was established. Youth activists describe how they are already refugees. Their ancestors were displaced from the land and moved to the hills of southern Palestine in 1948. Now they are under threat of losing their grazing rights and homes again, with all but two houses in their village served with demolition orders. So we began working with a small group of activists in 2017. We received funding late in 2018 and started scoping and piloting project ideas in the first quarter of 2019. And this was to engage young people in dialogue around responses to demolitions. Full project delivery then followed in April 2019. In this paper, we focus only on the scoping and pilot phase. The project was co-developed around three main aims to document and raise the profile of how young people informally respond to demolitions and how it impacts their future aspirations. Share this understanding with INGOs to change interactions within those organisations who can often position young people as passive victims and recipients of aid, which the activists found deeply problematic. And finally, to build solidarity and capacities for future resistance within neighbouring villages. So if, as part of the pilot phase with the activists, we co-created a series of prompt questions for young people to respond to. And from this scoping, we were inspired yet troubled by a decolonizing agenda in a context where land is contested and settler colonial violence dominates many Palestinian lives. To make sense of what we were trying to achieve, we started to distinguish between different orientations and praxis that came out of our scoping and pilot phase as requiring different ways of being and doing in these spaces. And in the paper, we position this as a tentative conceptual framework. So decolonizing in, responding inward in dialogue to our own background and our training at, in conversation with our collaborators and recognizing the Eurocentric frames of reference that can still remain prevalent in our work. And in the paper, we talk about this as a, as a dance, the Dakbar, which, which is a traditional Palestinian dance, which both highlights struggle, but also solidarity and celebration. In our second orientation, we've described decolonizing by, so responding outward as advocate through creative collaboration as a catalyst for challenging institutional perspectives by bringing to the fore alternative epistemologies and ontologies. And finally, decolonizing through responding to change and sustainment. So mobilizing cracks that aim to affect change beyond the research that speak to autonomous and communal forms of action and sociability. So we go into more detail about what each of these orientations mean in the context of decolonizing PD in the paper. But in the interest of brevity, we focus here just on one strand, decolonizing by. So what do we mean by this? So we we formally frame this as a challenging organizational perspectives by sharing alternative epistemologies and ontologies otherwise. We also think this is about sensitizing as well to organizational perspectives and perceptions of justice that may differ to those of our collaborators, our own expectations as designers and researchers. And a stark example of this was when at a workshop with INGOs that the activists could not travel to due to distance and checkpoint restrictions, 
As advocates, we've presented the work that the young people had been doing to prevent and rebuild after demolitions. We were met with a response that highlighted the necessity of data about demolitions that flattened young people's agency and indigenous identities. And in the paper, we refer to the work of Tuck and Wang that talks about decolonizing as a metaphor. At the same time, the organization felt this practice of data collection and sharing was important to generate particular kinds of support after a demolition had taken place rather than work on preventative strategies. So in this example here, the representative from the INGO formally highlights what they do in order to support those, uh, those families um, and communities that we were presenting in, um, their work about. So here they say, we document each demolition within 24 hours of it taking place and collect data and make this accessible to other NGOs who respond by pro providing shelter and international support. Many organizations work secretly in Palestine because Israel can take equipment. So we have a lot of detailed data as we have worked for many years to organize responses with NGOs as it was chaos. We have data on specifics of gender, children under 18 and adults over 18, but not on youth. So this differed to young people's perceptions of the value of that support being misaligned. When asked to respond to one of the questions about what the most effective forms of resistance was in preventing demolitions, young people often placed INGO support at the bottom. So this example here, where the activists used some of the questions that they developed to ask other young people in their village what the most to put into a scale, what the most effective forms of resistance were. Um, and this is the youth activist reporting back on some of the things that they found. So they are at the bottom and that's where he put the INGO projects, he said. He said, I don't need a blanket. I need someone to change the law. And that's what he explained. You know, when they demolish your house, the INGO, they bring you a refugee tent. They bring you blankets. They bring you pillows, he said. But we have enough blankets and stuff. So what we presented was how young people had developed multiple tactics within their communities for prevention, distraction and disguise to better navigate demolitions that was not recognised in the standardised data collection about demolitions. The contrast of different kinds of support and relevance of information helped to highlight how justice was differently aligned and differently practised and how it was understood for the young people experiencing demolitions and the INGOs often working at a distance under significant administrative and surveillance constraints. So to conclude, our aim was to pull focus and unpack potential unsettling geopolitical agendas present in decolonizing PD as practice, as praxis. We offered three decolonizing orientations in, by and through, and this was based on one case study. So as a way of distinguishing between different ways of being and knowing, we recognize that this has limits and there will be many more and not so clear in its distinctions. So we feel it's necessary to continue to question what we perceive as the very fundamental principles of decolonizing and its contemporary rhetoric in the context of design as an ongoing form of work. And we finished to ask what does decolonizing PD mean for the day-to-day -day realities of injustice and inequity? So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Uh, another wonderful paper full of uh, very important, um, very important questions for all of us and at the core of the of this uh, session theme. Um, I'm also checking about the, the uh, questions and answer uh, box and um, there doesn't seem to be any uh, clarifying pressing question uh, for you at the moment. And we have a few uh, already for the previous um, uh, papers. Um, so I guess if, if you would be okay, should we, should we move with the next one and then we will come together uh, for the, for, for 
for a final uh, longish conversation maybe so we can we can go ahead with um with uh, Yoko Rowan, Tania, Juan, Linus, and Jas uh, Steve. Thank you. Hi, my name's Yoko Akama. I'm from the School of Design at Aramage University on the lands now called Melbourne, Australia. I'm here to present this paper on behalf of my co-authors, Juliet, Arelli, Liam, Marius, Leah, Tanya, Emma, Rowan, Tanya, Juan and Linus. Thank you all for your contributions. Firstly, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country and offer this in my native language, Japanese. Ohayou gozaimasu. Jibun wa ima Melbourne, Australia to yobare Kurin Nation no tobu, Oiworan to Bunworan senju min no tochi ni sundemasu. Aboriginal to Torres Strait Islands shoutout min wa tochi ken o jou to shite orazu. 最初の住民飛び止める宣言はこういった会合ではとても大切な習慣ですこの土地で7万5千年以上持続されている文化知恵デザインと長老たちのレジリエンスに感謝するとともに今日様々な土地から参加されている伝統的カストリアンそれと自
to heighten the geopolitics of the Asia-Pacific region and raise disquiet about the maturing service design industry and practices that have spread here, imbibed with Western ideologies and privilege, by often ignoring the continuous designing that are rooted in lands, relationships and ecologies here for a very long time. I firstly like to thank the co-authors who are also pictured here and many other chairs, staff, other members of the local and international service and community who contributed enormously and worked through their patients with us during the pandemic. As they accompanied us, as we redesigned the conference from a physical to an online only event due to continued lockdowns in Melbourne. The most important participation is by the undergrad and postgrad students since 2018, so that's two years or more, where they researched, co-designed, workshopped, tested and iterated propositions of the ServDesk conference experience. These studios became a key learning vehicle for their understanding of design and service design, and by involving them for all that time, we asked them to challenge us, the conference organisers, who part of an academic community may have become too conforming and institutionalised, so they were trying to help us break out of our ossified norms. You see here an image from one of the undergrad studios and James there at, in the centre, who is doing a wonderful acknowledgement of country as part of a co-design session with participants from the service design community. Acknowledgement of country is a common ritual for many of us here in Australia. Yet for the conference, we were also attempting to habituate this practice through our classes, meetings, and also throughout the conference. Offering an acknowledgement means many things, depending on who and where you are. For us here on Kuli Nation, we follow the guidance of the Indigenous Elders. However, as one of our colleagues at RMIT, Peter West, describes, acknowledgement of country is fraught. He says it's an enactment that reveals what we've not been allowed to know or what we've willfully ignored. It triggers the anxiety of feeling inept and exposed. I know many of you at PDC 2022 were invited to offer an acknowledgement. So perhaps we can reflect on this thinking feeling in our discussions later. Nawit Caroline Briggs AM is a highly respected Bunurong elder and RMIT's resident Indigenous elder. Her welcome to country, given at formal gatherings, explains this welcome, woman Jika, as a request that asks, why are you here and what is your purpose? Here's a video of her explaining this. And according to our traditions, our lands will always be protected by our creator Bunjil, who travels as an eagle and by wine, who protects our waterways, travels as a crow. Bunjil taught us to always welcome guests, but he required us to ask all visitors to make a number of promises. One, not to harm the lands and waters and not harm the children of Bunjil. And this commitment is made through an exchange of a small bow dipped in the water of the land. So once again, Womanjika, Marambikbik, Bunurong, Nirmda, Barupton, Akta, Willem. I want you to part, firstly take the word Womanjika and understand how that connects you to this place. So it means come, ask to come, and your purpose for coming. So could you please say, Womanjika. Thank you, Obingunj. Oh, you have just articulated 2,000 generations of the ancestors' language that's still embedded in this land. Thank you, Bingun. As you heard, Nawit's welcome is a request to obey the laws of Banjo, which is a condition of being welcomed onto these lands, to manifest in our everyday living and working. So how do we enact our commitments? 
and also as conference hosts, invite the presenters and guests to attend to this conference, uh, attend to this consciousness. And at the same time, what ossified norms of design and conferencing can we trouble as decolonizing? I won't have the time to go through everything, so please go to the website servedes2020.org to see many other student propositions. But I'm just here to present a few of those of those propositions that were particularly compelling. For us to commit not to harm the lands and waterways of Bunjil, students considered how we could minimise impact in catering. They proposed meals that were plant-based and locally grown, avoid single use and choose social enterprises as caterers. We also see here how they designed a system for delegates to participate in cleaning, sorting and composting waste. To not harm the children of Bunjil, their work invited important considerations about those who clean, serve, provide security, who are often burdened at large events. These re revealed and trouble the hidden, racialized and class-based labor that provide such services. We learned from the students who came to study from neighboring Asia Pacific countries, the precarity of migrant work visa conditions and casual labour that belie convenient, efficient and seamless services we often take for granted. <laughs> Lastly, how can we also trouble Western centric norms and learn from designing that have been continuous on country? We were honoured by Professor Uncle Norm Sheehan and Dr Tristan Short's keynote that engaged in dialogue about what meat eating ants can teach us through visual intelligible patterns in environments as designing. And this was an important register and reference point throughout the conference. And I invite you to watch their keynote uh, through the Served as 2020 website. And it's just fantastic. The decolonizing we pursued was not about arm's length critique and theory, but a way to step into the turbulence and learn together through this. From this, we learnt that decolonizing is necessarily varied according to particular positionalities and historicities of whom, where, when and why. Acknowledgements can keep alive the consciousness of Indigenous sovereignty and honour relationships but they are also unsettling and need to be so. Decolonizing isn't about reconciling settler guilt and complicity because we can't step outside of what global histories has implicated us in. The undesirable propositions by students to clean up and sort waste is an invaluable lesson for us to be attentive to the invisible intersectional disadvantages that our systems and services perpetuate. Lastly, Nawit's question, why are you here and what is your purpose? This has a way of penetrating our feeling, thinking, spirit and soul that are harder to capture in evidence in a paper. This is a timely reminder of the complicities we here are participating in to keep questioning the mechanisms of knowledge sharing, like conferences, that can admit, exclude. To, so for, for us to pursue, what other practices can we welcome to bring in such ontological facets of being and becoming together? This speaks to so much more still to be done, to move beyond the disciplinary limits in design and research and to strive towards a richer, soulful, expansive ways for doing things differently when we come together in time and place, because we now know how rare those moments can be. The image I end with is another I've taken on my walks, where I saw those big basalt rocks being unearthed. You can see that in the background. This site has now become luxury apartments 
and these rocks, these ancient sentient beings that continue to be dug up are removed, chiselled, transported and used to build more infrastructures on distant lands. So as I make my way to Newcastle upon Tyne by London to join some of you, I hope to give respect to those stones at Trafalgar Square and to reflect on the history and futures of our ongoing coexistence. Thank you and arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Yoko and all your co-authors for also this wonderfully uh, reflexive um, paper. And while we are at it, I am now uh, welcoming um, all you uh, panelists, if you could please uh, turn on your, your videos uh, so we can, we can see them and then maybe um, start a larger conversation. I think we have about um, half an hour <laughs> to, to talk to each other, to uh, some of the um, questions and, and uh, thoughts that your wonderful papers um, have raised uh, on us. Uh, uh, looking at the question and uh, answers uh, box, uh, I don't see right now any pressing clarifying questions for uh, the, late, the last paper. Um, but I'm sure they might come uh, later. Uh, people have tend to uh, get a little bit of time to to phrase their 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 questions. So, uh, or, and then before going into more general questions, I just want also now to come back to Rachel's uh, paper because there was also one clarifying question that came after uh, from Joyce, uh, where she wanted to ask you uh, uh, how does the uh, NGO then responded to your to your challenge. Do you think they 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 did you were able to shift some of their perceived the importance they saw on this data collection? You know, I, I guess it's a little bit of a question about the impact and all uh, of 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 that little intervention. Um, <laughs> to be honest, no, I don't think. Uh, it was very different. I mean, I, I would love to go, yeah, we changed, you know, significant, we had significant impact. I just don't think we did. I think there is also in this particular context, they have to be, a lot of the INGOs and NGOs have to be really careful about what they advocate for publicly. And as a, a British researcher, they're very sort of guarded about what they tell you and what they share. Um, so, you know, I think every single interaction, and it was obviously after um, after the pilot, shortly after we went into lockdown, so this massively impacted our any kind of work with INGOs who just went into sort of crisis management. Um, but yeah, any interaction that we then subsequently had throughout the project was on Zoom. Um, and when we presented what we were finding, they would say, oh yeah, we already know that. Um, but I think that's quite common as well in, in these settings because they don't want to be undermined. They don't want to be seen as not knowing. Um, so yeah, so it, it's, we've not done a, you know, a, an, an assessment, any kind of real evaluation of how much impact. I doubt very little um, if, I'm, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, but yeah, it's a really good question. I, I, would we have had more impact had COVID happened? is a massive question mark. I doubt very much again, because I think the kinds of things we were doing, again, there were there were several things. One, youth is a category as well that's incredibly loaded. It's a kind of gift from the UN, I guess. Um, you know, this category of youth has suddenly appeared as an important category for INGOs to, to consider. But then as, as alluded to in the quote, um, they this particular INGO doesn't have data on youth. They have under 18s or over 18s, and those are the those are the categories. And I think, again, that's interesting when you're coming to representations of data, um, because that yeah, that what data you provide, which is different, then kind of cuts into those different categories. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think that also a little bit reflects on a question that was also asked from Male and Christine about were, were you able to to challenge. Uh, some of these uh, wor one world world researchers, and I think you already answered briefly in the in the text, Male and Christine. But if you could reflect briefly on that one, and then we can go on to more general uh, 
um, question? I think uh, I'll, I, I think it was me. I was changed significantly yeah. from the start of this project. I come from business management, so um, I'm very much about, I'm very pragmatic, very much about theories, models. Yep, yeah, you can apply this model to whatever you want to apply it to. Business managers, management is very much in the one world world. You know, we work on a trinity of efficiency, effectiveness and continual growth. And I think going to China and actually living there, not in Shanghai or Beijing, but in a rural community, um, really made me start questioning what I was teaching, like the very fundamentals of what I was teaching. I always thought that um, it was a force for good, you know, that we were we were helping um, countries develop and uh, and all those words now I just I just hate saying them because I'm like what are we doing from a anglo eurocentric position to all of these countries so I think the whole project and meeting Mali in China and um, the the adventures and the things that we went through um, as we were um, as we progressed over the last four years has really made me question everything <laughs> and I don't know if that if that counts as a researcher but I do I've said to Marley in the past I now feel so um, I don't know if it's ashamed or I feel very burdened now and I didn't before before I thought great I'm doing a great thing here now I feel incredibly burdened thank you um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, uh, with all of us, uh, uh, Christine. And Male, would you want to add something very briefly? Um, I think um, it's a little bit like um, uh, growing vegetables in the sea. I'm trying to translate that expression in Spanish. Um, but uh, we, I think the people that we were working with were very surprised about our ongoing negotiation with our own position like you are the experts just come and tell us and 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 we we were very uncomfortable about that and i think the paper um, the, the project was very much um, a small scale was a pilot and we work most of the time without funding um so the the, the whole paper is not the end of something it's just the the reflections of okay now that we felt all of this now that we are kind of looking for answers in these frameworks that were new for us as well um okay how we're we gonna do things and actually are we the ones that have to do things or where where we can work now <laughs> because um for example if 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 being in britain that doesn't let me work i mean i'm not even i'm intersect myself as well i'm from venezuela and and you know, so um, it's more about we looking for answers than we offering answers. It was more like that. Thank you so much, uh, Male. And now I, I would like to move a little bit onto, onto a more general discussion. And then I would ask uh, Jakob maybe to comment first on, on another question we have pending that's from Andy. Uh, and I think it, it, you have already said something or you're, you're talking to that question in your paper, but would you like to reflect uh, now with Andy's words about this idea of, of is, are we trying to create pure ethical forms and, and so that we can get published? And is this virtual signaling, all this um, kind of self-questioning we are, we are doing? What, what, what would you think? Yeah, I know, I mean, we have to think about um, what we are, what we can by the positions of power we hold, by the representations of institutions. Mali and Christina's paper about the, the you know, the funding bodies. Um, Jennifer's talk um, around the disciplines and the expectations of what, of what disciplines or design artifacts or objects do, and um, obviously. Um, Rachel's presentations and the various positionalities of so this really um, it's yeah it makes it a bit trite just to say how complicated and complex it is um, and um, but yeah it's it's hard to know exactly partly because there's so many moving parts whether one's action 
is actually doing anything or not. Um, and even though you might recognize our, well, at least one's positionalities, one's, uh, I, which is why I love the, the phrasing that um, Mali and Christina talked about, these technologies of power that you might have some access to, what, what really that's doing in terms of shifting the needle, it's really hard to know. Um, and all the, or even whether we are in a position to be able to say or evaluate that. So if, particularly in terms of Rachel's point about, you know, how is it affecting these people on the ground whose houses are being demolished? Um, so it, it is, I mean, the, the particular thing that makes it even more, I, I think from my or our particular paper was the fact that it's a conference. And, you know, it's, it's such an academic, is such an academic instrument and the whole, you know, well, Rachel will talk to you more about the labor that goes into doing this purely for um, knowledge advancement to kind of makes it, does make it sound a bit self-serving. Um, and so uh, we selfishly involved the students as a way to sort of keep them honest, I guess, to sort of just call it out to go, stop having your head up your butt and, um, you know, think of it, think about the impact of the promises we're making to the calling elders about, you know, the harm, not doing any harm. So, um, yeah, I think Andy's question is the question we, I guess we have to keep asking. Maybe we can't really answer it, but the point is to just, yeah, keep ourselves accountable, I guess. Thanks, uh, Yoko, for that uh, uh, reflection. There's also wonderful parallel discussion in the chat. Uh, I uh, recommend everybody to uh, to check uh, as well. Uh, and thinking a little bit about that, I, I and when reading all your uh, your very wonderful papers, I I thought uh, about these kinds of or you you kind of mentioned things or the tensions between this development and progress and 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 certain kind of like um um uh, respect for for what 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 was there. Uh, then uh, relation relationality, of course, appears uh, strong in 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 all of them. Um, but there's also discomfort uh, and complicities, and and a big question in all of them. I got a, a, once a paper in PD some year, years ago rejected because a reviewer thought that he couldn't see the IT nor the design. Uh, and I'm very happy to see in all these papers in our panel where you know that the I that we can challenge where where is the IT and where is the the design. So uh, I would like if you could all um, uh, reflect uh, a little bit on those and a comment that Laura is making about not just uh, the necessary discomfort but also the joy uh, of 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 uh, of the hope. Of being uh, being able to imagine doing some things differently. You are muted, Mal. Yes, now. I I thought I had the Zoom control after three years of zooming, but okay. No, I was thinking that we also have to um, think about um, what are their agendas of impact for example or knowledge production or what is the design in this um paper or what is the management in this paper um because they also this agenda response to a specific problems that may not be the problems that we're trying to engage with um so yeah basically the all the papers in this panel question our own roles as academics and as depending on what are our different roles and how we decide to use these reflections to make move things around us. But yeah, it is great to have you all in a, in a panel because our uh, proposals for funding have repeatedly um, been rejected because of that. Uh, and and it, this is great to find peers and that also don't have the answers, but <laughs> to think with. Thank you for this space. Thanks, uh, uh, Mali. Right, but um, thank you for that that comment. And it's something that um, uh, so yeah, really, really bothers me. I think it bothers me more. Um, the more I sort of 
uh, I guess, in academia or in, you know, or using conferences or relying on conferences for one's track record, I guess, because um, the more you are contributing to this mechanism to become more powerful as one of the um, important places for knowledge sharing, the lesser time or the lesser effort that I could be making towards doing opening up opening up other things. Um, and um, there's some other things that I think um, hopefully came through in the presentation was an, a big part of the embracing cosmology theme, the things that you just really cannot do justice through a paper alone. Um, these, um, you know, th the sentipensa, the, the thinking, feeling, uh, these, the commitments, um, these ancient stones, like these, there's so many layers to uh, our existence, our ongoing existence, our relationships to people, to places. ACM publishing, well, what, what the hell is that going to help us do? Well, some parts, but not all of it. So I do really worry about what's, you know, the 90% of stuff that doesn't get, um, doesn't, well, it maybe doesn't have to be in this space, um, but what, what other ways we can, we can get to through other mechanisms, other platforms, other ways of knowing and being, and um, how much that can enrich participatory design and design practices. Um, it, I, I do worry about that a lot. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Joyce. Uh, besides all the, the 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 wonderful keywords, I also uh, think we uh, some of, most of of your papers actually um, uh, discuss very little participation. I mean, by using the word <laughs> as it is. I mean, you you discuss the theme, but but the 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 usual the usual disclaimer of what do we we understand by participation was I, I guess a little bit uh, less present do, do you think uh, do you have any comment regarding that or this what uh, that could be for any of you <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say a few things, um, but they're not well formed, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, I think with the work we did in Palestine, we so just to in the paper we talk about the different um, disciplines we all came from. So uh, there was a big geography contingent um, in our team, and um, and a big uh, sort of legal contingent as well, which was um, defining you know some of the context and wider literature um, and I think we all had very different ideas of what was expected in terms of how what's appropriate forms of participation for uh, the young people we worked with um, mine was like let's design you know let's design the questions let's design the form um, you know let's sort of provide them with you know a, a set of what we do and then them you know then they get on with it and then come back to us and you know if they need any help and um, whereas my the more traditional geographers were freaked out by that completely um and so and what we did um which was um for them really highly participatory and just the fact of asking what that what the young people wanted to ask of each other was decolonizing in, in and of itself no question and I was like, well, I'm not really, <laughs> I'm not really sure. This is because we're leading this. We are, you know, we have this funding. You know, there's there, there are those background mechanisms that I'm, I'm not entirely sure how we talk about participation here because it's not, you know. But for them, it was like, well, they're doing it, you know. But that's because it was completely different to the way that they usually engage with people, which is just through interviews where they set the questions and then ask them. Um, so again, I think that's, you know, Christine alluded to this in, you know, in those when you've got interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary teams, you know, there are often these different perceptions of what, uh, you know, participation means in, in you know, and, and what, what it looks like for, you know, for those involved and, um, you know, I still, what we hoped would have happened is that um, the young people were able to take on what they learned from that process 
But again, we have no evidence for that because of what happened with COVID. But again, it may it, it was probably very difficult for them to do that once yeah. we weren't there. So again, um, yeah. So I don't know whether that answers your question, Andrea. But yeah, I think it's it's an interesting point about the different perceptions. I still feel we could have been more radical, you mm. know, and put less structures in place. Um, mm. But yeah, my colleagues were like, no, this is like completely, this is like really open. This is totally open. Um, yeah, so. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. What uh, does Ma uh, Male or, or Christine would like to uh, comment? We still have a few minutes. Not many. <laughs> so um, from my perspective, I don't come from a design background. So um, yeah. for me, particip participatory design, I suppose the work we did in China, uh, we got the students from design and uh, business management to put on a one-off performance of Henry V, uh, where they, they were given full license to um, design and to um, uh, sort out the production of the play, which was very scary. Uh, so I can take on what Rachel's other colleagues were thinking. This is really quite scary. These people have got so much space and room to do what they want and we have no control over it. So from my perspective, that's how I view participatory design is about letting the process go and seeing what designers and non-designers can create together outside of those boundaries so i don't know that that's my <laughs> <laughs> non-informed um perception of participatory design thank you so much uh, amalia i think you were also commenting uh for me yeah uh, is that a disciplinary difference of the understanding of participation that is a barrier because what i wanted to be as a participation it was not as the degree as i imagine i i I empathize with Richard, but also there is something that I will reflect a lot, and it's the, the authority of our identities. Um, when we arrived there, we were treated not a facilit as a facilitator, but as an expert. Um, the spaces were rent for us to, to offer our expertise. So we have to play in very inconvenient spaces and with very inconvenient teams. And they were expecting us to give a full lecture. And we were there with a workshop of making and sharing your own traditional ecological knowledge. And it was kind of, um, I felt that the first half an hour of all the workshops that we did, it was the people trying to adjust to us. Uh, like what is what is this? I saw this person come from emergency response in England, and it's gonna tell us a full class of how we're gonna do it now in the next flooding. Um, they are confronted with why our participants were confronted with why um, life threatening situations, same as Rachel. Yeah. Emergencies, and come with this. Oh, let's all be in the same sofa in a time of time critical moment is also hard. And then you start thinking, okay, so maybe maybe this authority that I'm being given, I need to negotiate it somehow. How to negotiate those was also a learning. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's so, so, so spot on. And I think resonates also with your co experiences. I I I I think we have uh, a couple of minutes, maybe Yoko, if you want to uh, say something and then we'll um, uh, close, uh, close up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, this the, this conversation really goes to the heart of um, yeah why we come together to talk about these things, um, the nuances, the complexity, the, the dynamics, and also um, I know Juan Juan's in the room, but I always really love the way Juan's always talked about the the, the not the non non participatory and. I know it's not, I don't think it's just a matter of semantics um, about what participation is and what it means. I think by even having a term that we all are coming around, you know, in very intensely uh, rigorous ways, um, we can also forget um, what that word shouldn't really mean and what it also, um, the things that may, we might not think it matters, why, why they might matter or not matter. 
Um, and I just want to also acknowledge um, the fact that I'm actually not on Munurong and Wurrung country. I'm here um, at uh, was it Ta Takanini Ta Takanini uh, Tamaki Makarau, um, hosted by the Aotearoa PDC Place. And um, every time um, there is a, uh, a a ritual, which I forget what it's called. Um, but the ceremony starts by um, calling the spirits and uh, calling the ancestors and calling the, the, the more than human of the place. Um, wh whether we call that participation or not, I don't know, but it really, it, it has created an energy in the room that I've always um, really super appreciated. So um, I know that's a little bit of a left field, but I do want to um, recognize there's so much we still don't know. And, but in other cultures, there are many ways that that has, that has been exercised. It's a way to remember, to remember things that we may have lost in our journeys to hear. So thank you. And thank you to the hosts. Thank you so much, uh, Yoko, for reminding us of uh, all the work that still needs to be done. Being uh, the, for, at 45 minutes sharp, uh, we will end this session. Thanking you uh, from the bottom of my heart for being able to, to join you here today. And please download the papers, uh, read them, share them, uh, send more questions to the authors and continue Please enjoying the wonderful program of PDC 2022 in Newcastle and in 16 different places around the world. It was uh, a great joy to be here. Uh, we'll see you soon. Bye bye.